Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Mancuso, and I lead communication efforts for the Summer Health Professions Education Program, better known as SHPEP. Tonight's session, Steps to Success with the SHPEP application, should be your first of many steps on your path into the health professions. And as you'll soon learn, SHPEP scholars have a legacy of success. Over 65% of our scholars who apply to medical and dental school are accepted. But what is SHPEP? Well, it's a free six week summer enrichment program for college freshmen and sophomore students who are interested in the health professions. And our program is truly committed to strengthening the career development of underrepresented and economically disadvantaged students while preparing them for a successful career in the health professions. SHPEP's roots go back to 1989 with its first cohort of scholars. Due to the noted declines of medical school applicants from racial and ethnic backgrounds starting in 1977, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation initiated a study in 1984 to learn strategies to change these trends. Findings contributed to the development of the Minority Medical Education Program to increase the acceptance rates of medical school applicants from racial and ethnic minority groups who were underrepresented in medicine. Over the years, the program's intensive academic preparation program expanded to several medical school campuses and the AAMC assumed the role of national program office in 1993. In 2003, the program changed its name to the Summer Medical Education Program, reflecting the inclusion of students representing a range of economic, cultural, and geographic diversity. In 2006, the program expanded to include dentistry and was renamed the Summer Medical and Dental Education Program. The program changed its focus to students in the first two years of their college education because the experience of previous programs indicated to us that this is when they derive the most benefit. And in 2016, in an effort to keep a pace of the growing importance of team-based care and interprofessional collaboration, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation expanded the program to include a range of health professions and changed the program name to what we know today as Summer Health Professions Education Program, or SHPEP. And students can gain experience in medicine, dentistry, nursing, optometry, pharmacy, physical therapy, and public health. And they can gain this experience at any one of our 10, 12 program sites, which are Columbia University, Howard University, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, UAB, UCLA and Charles R. Drew University, University of Florida, University of Iowa, University of Louisville, University of Nebraska Medical Center, University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, University of Washington, and last but not least, Western University of Health Sciences. Now, what are the benefits of our program? First off, it's free, but you know, students will receive housing, meals, a stipend, and travel assistance. And more importantly, they'll gain guidance from current admissions deans, health professionals, students in health professions programs, and our alumni base of over 30,000 about, about how to pursue their profession of interest. Now, what are the eligibility requirements? Well, you must be a high school graduate and currently enrolled as a freshman or sophomore in college, have a minimum overall college GPA of 2.5, be a U.S. citizen, a permanent resident, or have been granted DACA status by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and you could not have participated in the program previously. Now, there are other factors for consideration, and they include identifying with a group that's either racially or ethnically underrepresented in the health professions, or coming from an economically or educationally disadvantaged background, or having demonstrated an interest in issues affecting underserved populations. Now, I want to pause right here and say that our program sites engage in, engage in what's called holistic review, which means they're looking at more than just your GPA. They, they want to know the story. So it's critically important for you to submit a personal statement and a strong letter of recommendation so that they understand your, dirt, your journey and your distance traveled. Now, what activities will students participate in during SHPEP? Well, Students will gain academic enrichment in the basic sciences and math. They'll participate in career development activities such as mock interviewing and you know, crafting your CV and resume. Learning and study skills workshops, which will help you maximize working in individual and group settings. Exposure to clinical settings, which is what's needed in order to matriculate into a health professions program. 
workshops in financial planning and health policy, and interprofessional education that addresses effective collaboration across the health professions. Essentially, you'll learn how each of the health professions work with one another. Now, I wanna take this time to announce that for this upcoming summer, SHPEP will be offered as an in-person experience. Now, students who apply for SHPEP for this upcoming summer will need to follow the policies set by our program sites where they are accepted essentially and must adhere to an indoor mask mandate to participate in the program, even if they're fully vaccinated. I wanna emphasize that the health and safety of our scholars and program site staff still remains our top priority. Because the pandemic is really a fluid situation and guidelines are continuously evolving, our national program office is continually assessing the potential impact of COVID-19 and the, the impact it could essentially have on summer programming. That being said, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Stephanie Vink, who will, that, who will now go over the application nuts and bolts to get everyone prepared. Stephanie, feel free to take it away. Hello, thank you, Tony. Um, thank you so much for going over the history of the program and where we are today. And then of course, um, our COVID-19 situation. Um, before we jump into the application, I always like to kind of go to this page um, of the, our website and just show how like vital it is, especially before you, you hit submit or apply to these program sites. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the great thing about this page is it has our filter section. So you can filter it by, you know, the, the health profession that you're interested in, the start end dates. And then as we talked about before, you're really gonna need to know each program site's uh, COVID-19 policy, whether you need to be vaccinated, um, as we mentioned before, everyone needs to wear masks. So we will do our best to have these pages up to date. And of course, you know, you could apply now and things might be changed by March 15th, right? But we will do our very best to keep everyone on the same page and um, as any updates. But um, we do need you guys to kind of look through every program that you're interested in and see what's going on at their campus with regarding COVID-19. Um, another great thing to learn from this page is the uh, more about the program itself, what the site offers, you know, the meals, the stipends, things like that. And then another cool thing that I could talk about, like show you right now, you know, with the filter, it shows you the different health professions offered. So one of the thing, cool things about the application that you may not realize is that you can apply to um, different health professions tracks. So for example, let's say you're interested in medicine and dentistry. You can apply to maybe one or two sites as medicine and then one another site as a dental. Um, and that's what the filtering will help you figuring out which health professions is offered at which site. All 12 have medical, all 12 have dental. The others vary from site to site. Um, what you can't do is apply to one site under two different health professions. Like that doesn't work, but anyways. Next. Okay, so let's let's talk about what the application requires. So your application required materials. So as an applicant, you can submit one application only. On that application, you can choose up to three program sites, which we definitely recommend. Um, it increases your chances of getting accepted. Um, not saying, you, you know, it's just basically that. Um, and then you will need a, an official copy of, from, of a transcript from um, every post-secondary institution you've attended. Um, so this is a, a perfect example of this would be, let's say you were in high school, you took, you were duly enrolled at a community college, and then you transferred, you know, when you graduated, you started school at a, you know, four-year university, you would still have to get both transcripts sent in, regardless if it's on your current institution. Um, so that's something to note. So we need one from every post-secondary institution you attended. Another point I want to mention is if you are a first year freshman, you know, first semester freshman, please do not send in your transcripts until your fall grades have been finalized. We've had students before even send like a summer school, but we need like the sites need a whole semester, you know, um, of grades to kind of review before that. Another uh, part of the application is one letter of recommendation. Now, this can come from a pre health, pre -health advisor, a college professor within your major field or study. We also are very cognizant that, especially with freshmen, you may not be comfortable with 
you know, you don't know your college professors that well, or you don't have a pre-health advisor, you don't even know what major you are, that's all fine. We will accept uh, a letter from maybe a high school guidance counselor, um, science, math teacher, even a graduate assistants, or maybe you even worked or volunteered at it like um, somewhere in the health field, you know, those will all work as well. So we definitely, you have a lot of, a lot of options to choose from here. Um, another thing to note is to complete your application, we need all three of these things, right? So we need a submitted application, your official transcripts to go with it, and then your letter of recommendation. Until all three are connected, your application goes nowhere. So once you submit, if you don't have your stuff attached to it, it's not going anywhere. So that's, that's how you make a completed application that will be viewable to the sites. So another question I get a lot is like, what order should I do it in? It doesn't really matter in the sense that like, let's say you send your transcripts in now, let's say you're, well, let's say you're a sophomore, you know, you send your transcripts in now, your letter comes in later, and then you wait till February 4th for some reason to submit your application. That's all fine. I only, we only suggest that you at the bare minimum start your application so that if we get your materials in before you submit, we have something to attach it to. Because if you don't, then you, you have to like call us and we have to update it because at the time we were processing, there was nothing there, right? So even say a little bit further, if you're gonna send your transcripts in, best practice is to at least have the colleges filled out so that it's just readily easy for us to go boom. Because if you don't do that, then you run the risk of us inputting the information in wrong, like you know your start end date, things like that. So it's, it's always best to at least have something filled out a little bit ahead of time, but you don't have to wait, you don't have to submit your application and then send it in. So that's all I, it, it could be done all simultaneously. So when you send in your official transcripts, please make sure that you have your registrar do it. You can do it two ways. It could be either email to SHPP transcripts, that's plural, or they can do it, you can do a physical mail at, physical mailed in, um, or mailed in, I guess. Uh, so, you know, as long as it comes from the registrar's office, we'll take it. But if you send it in yourself or like issue to it yourself and send it to us, unfortunately we'll have to mark it unofficial. So please don't do that. It's a lot of money wasted and time. Um, we do have a deadline of February 5th. So everything needs to be timestamped or postmarked by that date in order to be accepted. And as I mentioned a second ago, you know, if you're, if you email them to us or forward transcripts, even if they, they come in the mail sealed, unfortunately, we, because it's not issued to us from the registrar, we'll have to mark it unofficial. Um, we only accept one copy of each transcript. So that means if you're a sophomore, like example, if you're a sophomore right now and you send it, your transcript in now, we take that one now. We do not take an updated copy in the spring. Okay, so that's your choice on if you wanted to wait later to apply or to send them in or now. Um, so that's up to you. They will use your previous, you know, um, previous uh, semester grades to look at your GPA and things like that. Um, if a site wants to know your updated transcript, they will email you directly. So, but in terms of what we accept, once we get your, once we get your transcript and apply it to your account, it's done. And then, you know, before you request, make sure you have everything that you want on there. Example, like if you're kind of going back and forth about a grade change, you know, please don't have that sent in before that, those things are finalized. And of course, as I mentioned, if you're a freshman, you have to wait until your fall grades are posted. All right, letters of recommendation. They can be sent in two formats. We do have a form, it's available on our website, um, or it's also available on the application landing page. There's a link there for it. Or you can have them do a, you know, a traditional recommended, uh, recommendation letter, um, if printed on official institution letterhead. Um, as long as it's signed, and you, can, you can use either or. We recommend that and we do highly recommend that they email it because Mailing is fine, we'll definitely take it, but 
if it gets lost in the mail or you know something happens, we don't really have record of it. Um, so yes, what we don't want you to do is have them send it both ways because it just it's a lot of extra work for us and creates duplicates. So one or the other, please. So some tips for the recommendations. Um, always give them an earlier deadline. Uh, we only take one reference and we will take the first one. So that's something to be aware of. I would always suggest maybe you have a backup or you know someone, you can ask you to do it and we'll, we'll take the first one, right? So at least you covered your bases there. Um, another cool thing that we added though this season was now when you submit your application. So when you submit your application, the only thing you can update is you know, your biographical details. Um, and that was pretty much it, right? But now you can go in and I'll show you later on a different slide what it looks like, but you can edit your letter writer. So if today you ask someone, they say yes, and then it's already December, January, and they, they can't do it anymore, you can go in and boom, adjust it there, get a new person, put in their information. The next, well, very important part of the application, as Tony mentioned earlier, is the personal statement. So you definitely want to take your time on this. Um, and this is really your time and application to shine. You want to talk about your interests, your experiences, why you want to do uh, a career, in, you know, pursue a career in healthcare. You want to just give the program sites a better view into who you are and, you know, why you think you should be a part of this program. And so some tips that we give on a broader level, I guess, um, definitely check for uh, your grammar, you know, your spelling. Um, you only get 600 words for this, right? So you wanna be like as impactful as you can in those 600 words. Um, another tip we give is take some time writing it, take a break from it, come back to it. You'd be amazed how much comes back or, you know, things can change or, you find what you're trying to say if you just let it incubate a little bit. Um, and don't forget about our mission. You know, why is diversity healthcare? Why is it important? Um, and another key inf information about this, as I mentioned on an earlier side, you can mix, you can apply to different health professions, right? You definitely want to make sure you speak to those in your, your personal statement. So for example, if you're applying to two sites as medical and one site as a denti dentistry, you want to incorporate both why medicine and dentistry is important to you so that when the dental, you know, reviewer of the application reads it, they're not like, oh, this person only wants to do medicine, right? So make sure you, you speak to both uh, health professions in that personal statement. <clears throat> so the application timeline, um, February 5th is the key date that you need to know at least for submitting and getting the materials in. This deadline is an Eastern time deadline. So please, please, please do not be on California and think that you have till midnight because you will lose your opportunity to apply. And once this application closes, we cannot open it back up. So please know your time zone, make sure you have it set for the Eastern time. If you're gonna, you know, be waiting until the last day to submit the application. Um, with the materials, it's uh, it's just a February 5th deadline, um, and that is a postmarked or time stamped. So that just means that, you know, the post office has to mark that, you know, transcript in the mail with the February 5th, and then the time stamped is also February 5th if it's sent electronically. Decisions will be released on March 15th, 2022. Program sites will be begin to start accepting students on March 17th if there is space. Now here's something I always like to tell people is on decision day, you might get accepted to one site, maybe waitlist to, to another, right? What people don't know is they only have the two, or they don't realize is that they do have two business days to accept that decision for the, you know, confirm the acceptance and your waitlist will not change before that. So if you do not, ex confirm at that site, you will lose that spot and you'll be taking 100% risk on the wait list. So 
basically my point is don't don't wait the two days for the waitlist to change because it's not going to it will just remain that and then after that date so you know some people they do wait and then they they're risking it all on the waitlist and they may not be accepted so another point um, and once you're accepted to the, once you confirmed and accepted to the program site, you will be working with that program site. We, we pretty much hand you off to them and then you guys will coordinate the next steps of the program. So let's look inside the application. I don't know if any, if, you know, if you haven't started it yet, you might want to register, open it up, check it out. Um, once you complete an app, or sorry, submit an application, this is what the page you'll look at, or see, sorry. And you'll see that we put submitted everywhere, you know, the top congratulations. Uh, and then there's a view detail section. So I circled, or sorry, squared the submitted because there is a difference between submitted and completed. So if we click on the view detail section, so next slide. This could, it's potentially what your, your application could look like when you log in for the first time to see your status. So until you submit your application, you won't see the transcript and letter status. Once you submit, you can see it. If you are waiting to submit, you know, you're taking your time, whatever, you can always give us a call or an email and we can check your transcript and letter status that way. And then of course, like I said, once you submit, you can see what's going on live right there. Um, there is several statuses your documents can be in. Um, as you can see, we have a yellow, a green, and a red. The red is not yet received. Uh, you want to change it to green, like that's your ultimate goal, received and verified. In the middle stage is received and processing, right? And when I talked about earlier where you could update your reference, here's the part where I was talking about, and I circled it right here. You can update this as long as we haven't received and verified your recommendation. So once we get it and we apply it to your account, it's locked. This goes for the same thing with transcripts. But you can't update your transcripts here. It, once you submit, you submit. But um, yes, my point is that once we have it, even if you haven't submitted for your transcripts, it's locked if we have it. Um, what else could I say about this? Um, yeah, I mean, once once you get the green, that document is good. And then once you have all your documents in each section, then your application is complete. Here's what I was just talking about earlier. I mean, they were the you know yellow, green, and red. Um, and then there is one more status that we didn't go over, which is unofficial. This is what we were talking about. If you mail in your own transcripts, something like that, you will get an unfortunate email saying it's unofficial. And you also get an email when we uh, hit receive and processing. Um, and received in processing, again, it's the limbo stage, it's the yellow. So you want to make sure that it turns green. So you just have to keep checking your application and contact, contact us if, you, if it's been a few days, it's been sitting there. You want to go ahead and see why isn't it verified yet. Uh, I kind of went over this already. Sorry about that. But yes, you can see this when you can see your your status of your documents after you submit and definitely give us a call if you want to check before that. So that being said, let's talk about a completed app, how you know you're going to log into your application. You can see it says completed everywhere. This is the goal. This means if you're in this status, it means that the sites have access to your application finally, right? So and then you would hit the view details section. And then boom, you see this. This is also where you can see at the bottom here, the three sites, see it's green, 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 it's a beautiful color. And when you see it at the bottom here, you see in review. This is the spot that you're gonna come back to on March 15th. So once you complete your app, you know, it's all green, you're happy to go. You don't have to log back in until March 15th to see your results. And you're gonna come back to this page and then they will, as my boss always says, it's the big reveal. It will be all your accepted, not accepted, or waitlisting situation. And then you can also confirm via this page. So this page is super important throughout the application season. So 
some over going again over tips of the application. Um, I would suggest apply early. It's not necessarily that you get chances are getting accepted or higher. It's just really for peace of mind. We get a lot, and I mean a lot of materials the last week of the deadline. I'm talking thousands. So you don't want to be that person that's constantly checking because it, you know, for a small office, we do things by hand. It's not automatic. So it's just a, it's just a longer wait time to get your materials processed. You just want the peace of mind of having it done. So my I always tell people a good goal to have the application completed by, or at least have your materials in, I would say. Uh, early January, mid-January is good, is a good goal to kind of achieve. Even if you wanted extra time to submit your application, that's fine. But if you know that they're they're on your app waiting, good to go, then you'll be good. Um, don't forget to remind your letter writer about the deadline. Again, I would encourage an earlier deadline. And then I would always say email is definitely preferred. Um, and last, don't be that person that gets unofficial transcript. You're just going to waste your money and time. Um, make sure that your school sends it in. And now, like I said, you have two ways of doing it, either through the email or by mail. And then I, I think the other last tip that's not really spelled out here is just be on top of your application, check your status, contact us if it feels weird, you know, or, you know, it's been too long. We definitely will look into it for you. And one last time about the decisions, as I mentioned that March 15th is a great day. You're gonna log in. And as I said the before, March 17th is the day the waitlisting status would change. So definitely think about it if you're accepted to another site, if you wanna confirm before that, because you will lose your spot. Um, and then waitlisting, waitlisted applicants, it's kind of tricky. You have to check each day. Again, after starting March 17th, you'll check each day. Um, you may or may not get an email from the site if it changes. I wouldn't. I would check each day just because some sites do email, but they always, you know, goes to junk mail and they'll, you'll lose your spot. So it, we have to move quick on this because some sites start as early as May. So um, it's just constantly, you know, staying on top of that, checking your status if you're waitlisted. All right, and I will pass it over to our alum extraordinaire, Austin Rios. Hey Austin, how you doing this evening? I'd like for you to introduce yourself um, so that everyone knows who you are and just give us a little bit of insight into, you know, where you are on your path right now. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony, for having me here tonight and good evening to everyone um, who are here as participants today. Um, I'm so excited that you are here with us today listening to our presentation. Uh, I hope that you're learning something new and that there's something interesting that you've already latched onto that's making you excited about our program. Um, so my name is Austin Rios. I'm in my third season as an SHBUP ambassador for the program. I participated in the program back in 2018, if you can believe it. I was an alum of the UT Health uh, Houston site. Um, back then we were in person and I'm very excited that you guys will also have that same opportunity as well. Um, I'm currently, as you can see on the slide here, getting ready to embark on my next opportunity as an Archer Fellow with the University of Texas System. I'll be doing some policy work in DC next January. Um, and I've recently been admitted to medical school. So I will be attending medical school um, early fall, late summer of next year. Congratulations, Austin. That's amazing. Thank you know, you. let's start. Let, let's, you know, I could just imagine how happy you are right now. And you know, I can tell that, you know, just knowing you and working with you over the years, that SHPEP has really had a tremendous impact on your journey. So let's start from the beginning. How did you learn about SHPEP? You know, I was not as fortunate as everyone on this call today. I didn't get to the chance to, you know, interact with an ambassador or attend a presentation or a seminar on our program. Uh, it's actually just by chance that I Google searched summer programs and SHPEP was one of the first results that came up. Um, and as I had the chance to read over the, the mission statement, what the goals are for the program, really what you can take away from it, um, there was just no way that I couldn't, that I could just give up that opportunity. 
So what made you apply? Well, like, what was the moment that you said, you know what, I need to submit this application now? Yeah, so I think everyone, our participants in the call today, um, and I, of course the program targets themselves to recruit students who are pretty young in their academic careers, first, second year in general to college students. Um, and they might not know, Tony, that uh, applications and applying for funding, applying for programs, scholarships, that's just something that you're gonna do your entire college career, maybe even health professional career in general too. Um, and it's very, very fresh in my mind right now because I'm actually applying to another scholarship that I'm, I'm hoping to get, uh, but it, it still applies here. Uh, and there's this old saying about, uh, you can get two birds in one stone, something like that. But SHPEP is different um, because our application site, you can actually apply to three sites with one application. And that's very unique. If you apply to any other enrichment program, you're really applying to one site, one program specifically, and it's not as robust um, of an application and you put so much effort into it and uh, you really get the most money out of your, of your application, I guess you could say, uh, in general from this one app. Um, but I guess that's really the logistics of why I decided that SHPP was a great site to apply to, but more so, I really wanted to get the foundations of what it would be like to be a health professional. I attended a community college as my first year in undergrad and I didn't have a pre-health advisor. I was really, really not sure of where my career was gonna go um, that early on. I didn't have any advising. I'm a first generation college student and my family comes from a low income family as well. So I didn't really have anyone to ask for help. Uh, but mentoring and networking are part of the program in SHVEP. And that's one of the most incredible resources that you can get as a scholar in this program. And um, that's something that really called out to me. So what was the day-to-day -day like? You know, tell me a little bit about your, your instructors and, you know, what was your daily schedule? So in 2018, we were in person. And again, I'm really excited that everyone on the call will be able to have that opportunity if they're selected for the program. I was at UT Health Houston and the students there were actually housed at Rice University in their dorms right across the street from McGovern, um, UT, the UT Health system in general. Um, and that was really, really an extraordinary experience, just being able to be among other students who have the same goals as you, that want to see each other succeed. And just being in a very collaborative environment was very, very unique. And there has not been another experience that I've been a part of that was really so resound, I would say. Um, so your, your typical day for me, at least at UT Health, was something along the lines of having maybe an eight o'clock wake up, for example. I know that can be intimidating for some, but you get used to it pretty quick. Um, but lecture or so at around 9 a.m. at uh, one of the sites at McGovern, whether it be at McGovern Medical School or the dental, the dental school not too far away on the UT Health campus itself. And throughout the day, we would have lectures and they really varied. UT Health was really special for me because they had a strong emphasis on academic enrichment. And I know a lot of students really are looking for that in a program where they do some basic introductory stuff in physics, biology, chemistry, organic chemistry. I know that's a really big class that a lot of people are afraid of. Um, just getting that foundations work, whether it be an hour a day, every other day, or once a week in stats, um, that kind of stuff really prepares you for the classes that you're going to be taking as a pre-health student down the road. So that was really the day-to-day -day life, I would say. Eight o nine o'clock or so start lecture. Um, and it wasn't always academic-based lectures as well. We had um, seminars and information sessions on financial literacy, health policy, and so many other things that really just give you that foundation that professional schools are looking for. That's so unique. You mentioned earlier in, in, your converse, in our conversation the importance of mentorship. Is mentorship available through this program? And you know, how did you interact with students and staff while you were there? SHPP is very, very, very deep in my heart. One of the most important um, activities that I was ever a part of. Um, again, that relates back to whenever I didn't have anyone to rely on, anyone to ask questions for. But the instructors at UT Health in, in SHPP in general were there to support you and they were there to support me. And more than that, um, at UT Health specifically, they really made me feel like I belonged and that I belonged with them. That's something that I say in one of the promotional videos that I made for them. 
it's very important that um, individuals that come from maybe underrepresented uh, minorities or categories in medicine find that support that they need. Because without that support, it's really a tough road to go into the health professions, I think. And I can't imagine where I would be now if I didn't have that support. Uh, one person really comes to mind and I have to give him credit. His name is Dr. Pedro Mancias. He's one of the co-PI, co-directors of SHPEP at McGovern, or ET Health. Um, he and I have been talking ever since 2018 when I first met him, that's one summer. Um, and every so often I, I'll send him an email, hey, Dr. Mencius, I'm doing this right now. What are your thoughts on this? Um, and he was always happy to reply. And I was just really lucky to be in his presence and in of his wisdom more than anything. Um, he's been a constant figure in my career, in my progression into getting into medical school. And just recently I met with him again after a few years of not seeing him face to face. We were only corresponding in per or I'm sorry, in email. Um, and it was just really, really nice to see him again. I shadowed him while at SHBEP, and I remember sitting across from him in his office when we were talking about something many years ago. And it was just a fond reminder of the experiences that we had together that one summer. That's amazing to hear. Uh, you know, the the what you've gotten from mentors at during SHPEP, from students, staff, faculty. It just sounds all amazing. I'm going to pivot us over to more of the clinical aspect of the program. Tell me about your clinical experiences and how have they prepared you for your future? Yeah, I think something that a lot of professional schools are looking for is to make sure that students who are coming to those programs are aware of what that job is, what that career is like. So we can take dentistry, for example. Dental schools want to know that a certain applicant has gone out of their way to make sure that they know what it's like to be a dental student, to be a dentist in general. Um, and shadowing is really one of the best ways to do that. You can get a job in the clinical setting, but shadowing is very unique because you're really right behind the, the professional themselves, dental, dental, a dentist, a, a physician, a podiatrist, um, any other, a nursing student. All of those different career tracks, I think the same can be said. Uh, my experience at SHPEP um, certainly did have a clinical aspect in an observation period. I did shadow Dr. Mencius, I mentioned that. Uh, but a part of the program as well, I met some radiologists and I got the ability to learn about how to read an x-ray. I didn't really know what I was looking at, but still it was a lot of fun to, to talk to the radiologists and get their opinions. and. Just be quizzed on some stuff. It was really fascinating to be in that clinical setting. Um, so I was with radiology that summer. Really, it was just a neuro for me. It was just neuroradiology, and Dr. Mencius is a neurologist, a pediatric neurologist. So I followed him around on the unit as well. I saw some of his patients with him one morning. You know, you, just hearing you speak about what this program has done for you, it's been great. You know. I'm wondering, do you have like one particular moment, maybe your most memorable, as far as like, you know, what, what was that moment for you that you said, well, I'm always going to remember this? Yeah, that's a hard one, Tony. I have to say, there was just so much going on in six weeks. You'd be surprised how fast it goes by. Um, and I really hope that those who are on this call today get that experience. Um, six weeks, you know, in hindsight is just a month and a half but you're surrounded by these people who wanna see you succeed and they wanna have the same goals that you do and you're there to support each other. Um, so a lot of that comes down to personal development. And I think that was really something that stuck with me. I went to a community college my first year of undergrad, as I mentioned, and uh, I felt like in a way I was successful there. And I think a lot of other students can say the same, no matter if they're at a community college or not. Um, your first year, you're new to the arena, you're a new undergrad, you just came from high school, uh, you're maybe not so sure where things are going next. And for me, although I was academically successful there at the community college, I didn't really grow and found, find a community to belong to. Um, and that was something that I really was missing out on. But it wasn't until I came to SHPP and was surrounded by just so many incredible people um, and the experiences that we had together have made me know for sure that some of the friends that I made there are my lifelong friends. 
one experience that really calls out to me um, was actually the Pride event that um, UT Health was a part of and back in 2018. Houston had a Houston Pride Parade. Um, and some of the scholars and I gathered together and we all went out to the Pride Parade. Um, just that was the first time I ever had that kind of experience, just being together with others. Um, was really, really a great experience for me. And I talk about it all the time uh, as I'm interviewing for med school now. Um, I can't, I can't talk, talk enough about how incredible those six weeks were. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I want to emphasize, like, you know, I, at least my view anyway, that I've always felt that SHPEP is more than just a six-week program. And I'm getting that sense from you too, right? Absolutely. That being said, how have you stayed involved with the program even after those six weeks? Yeah, so I have to tell the story of um, this one woman I met after I transferred from community college, um, because I think that played a role in why I'm still involved in SHPEP now and why I hope many others will follow after me. Um, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anyone to follow before SHPEP. And when I made it to UT Dallas is where I'm at, an undergrad now. I wasn't sure if I was going to find my place there. And one person stood out. Her name was Dr. Karen Delibares. She was the HPAC director, the pre-med office director at the time. Um, and she was really one person who believed in me in a time just that, shortly before that, after, before SHVP, where people told me I couldn't do it, or people told me that I would never be able to do what I'm doing now. Um, and she believed in me. And she, before she left, she actually retired recently. I was the first person she told that she was going to retire. She told me that she wanted me to repay her in the way of making sure that I could pay it forward. Um, and that to me meant making sure that other students who were like me, who were marginalized, come from minority communities, uh, first generation college students, they came to a community college, they're Latinas, African-Americans, whatever their identity is, that they have that same opportunity to be a part of the extraordinary experiences that I've had. Um, and for me, I wanna make sure that those students find the way to get into SHPP. And that's one of the things that I'm doing now. And that's part of why I'm here today. Um, the SHPP ambassador program um, is one of the great ways that I've been a part of um, staying involved with the, the community in general. Um, there I'm able to provide application advice to students and I've had many successful applicants that have come after me. Um, in addition to the ambassador program, we also have the SHBP Connect newsletter. Every so often, the National Program Office sends out notifications on scholarships, other programs, um, opportunities that are laying around, and just really keeping us up to date and keeping us connected as an SHBP community. We're such a rich and heartfelt community. Over 30 years of alumni have passed through the program. Um, and I guess there are several other opportunities, scholarships from SHBP in general, um, and we also have an alumni base where individuals who have been a part of the, the program can sign on, make a profile, and make themselves available to connect with others. Thanks for sharing that, Austin. And I'm going to pivot us over to the Q&A portion of the session. So, you know, audience, this is your time to ask any questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, in order to ask your questions. And I do have a couple that have come up, so I'm gonna ask them as they come up. So Austin, this one I will give to you. Could you elaborate a little bit on what kinds of academic enrichment you receive through the program and how it's helped you? Yeah, so um, my program site had us, had professors actually from local colleges, some of the faculty at UT Health themselves presented um, lectures and information to us. So I remember Dr. Spears, he's one of the other co-directors of SHVP at UT Health. He actually gave us a lecture on the bone anatomy, so osteocytes, osteoclasts. Um, and he actually ended up taking us to the cadaver lab at one point. And we learned the, the anatomy of the heart, the brain. We saw a brain and held it in our own hands. Those are just some of the examples that I had, really getting to do hands-on learning, something that you don't really get in a normal class where you're just reading the textbook, reading the slides. Um, but we also had professors come in and teach us physics. They had little presentations for us where you could take notes on. And those, those kind of stuff are really important 
um, especially for me, because I knew that I was going to struggle in physics. That was, it still is ingrained in my head as one of the most challenging courses I think I've taken for my pre-health requirements. Uh, but having that leg up, you pretty much have the first unit worth of that prerequisite learned from SHVP. It's not fully comprehensive, of course, it's only six weeks, but having that uh, opportunity to get your foot grounded in that semester where you know you might have a difficult semester um, can really make the difference in making sure you're successful that year. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna ask Stephanie a question now. Um, Stephanie, could students apply to multiple sites? I know you went over this a little bit earlier in the presentation, but I know you also gave like some really helpful tips with that. Would you mind sharing that again? Sure. Um, so to answer your question, on the application, there, there's a section called program sites, and this is where you can select up to three. It will, that page will list all of the health professions that are available at that site as well. So this is what I was kind of going over a little bit. It's a little confusing, you know, when you kind of look at it, but once you see what you're on the application, you'll see what I'm talking about, but you can mix match the health professions. You just can't have the same, you can't have multiple health professions at the site in terms of applying for that track. So to give an example, again, as I mentioned before, you, if you're interested in maybe medicine, and let's just say, let's throw, you know, autometry, you could apply to two sites as, you know, two different sites as the medical track and the third site, you have to find the site that offers it, um, optometry. So that's something you can do. You also remember that this program is very interprofessional. So you could also look at it this way and go, well, let me apply to a site that has, you know, optometry available as a track so you'll still get some exposure to it but you could still stick in the track that you might most be preferred in like for example medicine or something so that's another way to look at how to apply for sites as well um, if that wasn't too all over the place <laughs> no thank you for sharing that um, Stephanie I really appreciate that now Austin I have a couple questions for you so how should you pick sites to that that you apply for? How do you how do you pick the sites that you want to apply for? And you know, a couple of our audience wants to know, you know, what sites did you apply to, and how did you structure how to pursue um, like your future? Like, how did they help frame that? Yeah, so that's a really really great question, Tony. Because uh, I think as myself, I don't read SHPEP ambassador, I'm sorry, I don't read SHPEP applications, but I do read applications for another similar program at another institution. Um, that's structured pretty similar to SHPEP, but the point is I um, have a little experience reading some applications. And to me, the most important thing to convince me that an applicant is ready to attend a program is if they can tell me why they specifically want to attend and what that program can give them in return. Um, so I'll take SHPP um, UT Health, for example. There's one thing that's really unique about them that I really liked and that they started implementing in my year, and that was exercise wellness. So if you're someone who's really looking for uh, to really explore that outlet, you might want to talk about that a little bit. Say, hey, I know that um, I want to explore exercise wellness, and this program site has that. So I'm going to decide to apply there. That is a really smart way to prioritize how you want to apply. because Although you get three, there's still only three. Um, as far as the program sites that I applied to, I can't remember all of them by name. Of course, UT Health. I think I ended up applying to Columbia. Um, and I'm blanking on the third one right now. Um, I think I ended up getting accepted to UT Health and waitlisted to Columbia. Um, but I know Stephanie talked about this earlier. Um, if I decided to let go of my UT Health acceptance, I run the risk of not getting into Columbia and not having an opportunity that summer. So that was a really hard decision for me to make. Um, and then as far as making sure that they have really tailored something for me, I just, like I said, go on shpp.org and read the descriptions that are on the site about those program sites and look at what's something that yeah, makes you interested. What are you looking for to get out of that program specifically? Thank you for that, Austin. As I scroll through, um, I'm trying to keep um, every, you know, you and Stephanie both in the conversation. So this question is gonna go to Stephanie. 
Stephanie, can international students not registered with DACA apply for SHPEP? Um, good question, but unfortunately, no. Um, you have to have hold one of the status uh, that was listed before at the time of the application. So that's another key thing we could talk about real fast is um, if you're waiting for one of these statuses to be finalized, you cannot hit submit until you have it. Um, it just runs, you know, we've had people that were in the process and unfortunately they didn't get the status in time of the program start date and then they had to lose their spot. And it just, yeah, it just can't happen that way. So you have to be one of the three that we spoke about. <laughs> Thank you for that, Stephanie. Now, you know, I see um, attendees asking if this session will be recorded. Um, will they be able to get a copy? Yes, you know, the session will be recorded and you will receive a follow up email within the next couple of days as soon as it's posted to our YouTube channel with the link to the session. So definitely stay tuned for that. And, you know, as far as freshman students, this one's going to Stephanie too. So do freshman students need to wait for their first semester grades? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, and I even saw another question in the chat. How can, you know, freshmen apply early if they have to wait till December? December is still pretty early to get everything in, to be honest. As I mentioned, a good goal you want to have every, at least your materials in is early January. And that's just because early to mid even, but I'm telling you that last week of January and the, the deadline week, it's just super stressful. And we, you, you just want everything in before that bare minimum, get the, all the materials in. Um, but yeah, the program sites need at least a semester semester's worth of grades to review. Um, so that's why we, we have to ask you to wait. Um, and again, if you were to, let's say your grades were posted December 15th, and you got it in like a few days later or got them sent out, you're still miles ahead of a lot of people because a lot of people, unfortunately, do wait to the deadline week. Perfect. Thank you for that, Stephanie. And I'm going to ask myself a question just because I want to be involved with the conversation, too. So I'm seeing a lot in the chat, in the in the Q&A. What does it mean to be underrepresented? So, you know, that includes individuals who identify as African, African-American or Black. American Indian or Alaska Native, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, or coming from communities from low socioeconomic or, edu ed or educationally disadvantaged backgrounds as well. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, give insight into what it means to be underrepresented and disadvantaged. Now, as I go through the rest of the questions, give me one moment. So Stephanie, this one's for you as well. Um, the student is a junior and they just learned about SHPEP. Should they still apply? Are they still eligible? Could you give us insight into that? Yeah, um, unfortunately, um, if you have 60 credits or more, you're not eligible for the program anymore. Um, and honestly, I, I know that doesn't seem fair and all this stuff, but um, there's just so many more opportunities for upper classmen and um, you know post post bachelors out there. I mean, maybe not on the the, the grand scale of like nationally, but um, there's not many programs out there for freshmen and uh, sophomores in college, and this is this is one of the the main reasons why we had to like cut it off. But unfortunately, no, um, we. We, we do look at the, the credits and if you're over that amount, then you won't, you can't be considered. And I have a follow-up question to that question too, Stephanie. So as far as like, I heard you mention like a 60 credit total, like what's counted within that 60 credit total and what's now is like, is dual enrollment counted? Is our AP credits counted? Like I, I need a little bit more clarity on that if you could. Great question, yeah. So you can take out the AP courses because those are technically advanced placement and you, you know, you're doing it at a high school level. Dual enrollment is different. Dual enrollment literally means you're enrolled in two places at once, right? 
So when you're dual enrollment into like a community college or whatever, that is a post-secondary institution. You are getting, you're, you're doing a college course. So that's why we also need the transcript from it, regardless if you had it transferred to your current institution. Um, so those count. So you can, like, let's say you look at your, your totals and you have a bunch of AP courses, you can minus those out. Um, but, you know, the dual enrollment, the stuff that are like college courses, yeah, you, you count those. Thanks for clearing that up, Stephanie. Austin, would you say SHPEP gave you a boost in your application to med school? And was it one of the factors that you gave in your interview? Like, did you discuss it? Like, did you bring it up? Could you give us a little bit more insight on that? Yeah, so SHPP was actually one of my most, um, most, most meaningful activities. And for individuals who are applying to AMCAS and TMDSES, which is the application service for medical students or aspiring medical students, you actually get to choose three activities out of 10 or so. Um, at least for AMCAS, to indicate that those are your most meaningful activities that you've done in your undergraduate career. Um, and SHBP was one of them for me, um, because I can speak so extensively about it and I've been involved with it for so long. Um, so I would say it definitely, I remember actually vividly one conversation I had with an interviewer at one of my medical schools. Uh, we and I, he and I really just started talking about SHBP, the work that I did for the program afterward and why it was so meaningful for me as a scholar to be a part of it. I always like to tell people that SHPP was really the foundation of my undergraduate career because I did everything else after that. Um, and what I did after is kind of a little irrelevant, but in any case, SHPP was so foundational to telling me, I know now that I really wanna be a physician and my career, my career path is to become one. Um, and I wouldn't have known that otherwise if I didn't do SHPP. Thank you for that, Austin. And, you know, just to follow up, do you think it's a smart decision to apply to programs that are out of state? Yeah, so I can't really comment on how individual admissions committees look at out of state or in state applicants, but I will say that you should refer back to what I said before. And that's that if that's something that at that program site is really calling out to you and you can say, hey, that's what I want and I think I can really benefit from that, then you really stand a good chance of applying to that program and being successful. Um, those, those are really important things. So I would say that you should look broadly. Um, chances are you might not have more than one or two program site in your state or in your vicinity. So might as well go ahead and just add another site being maybe a little farther away and maybe out of state. Um, so that's that would be my general advice for that question. Thank you. Stephanie, about how many students are accepted to SHPEP per year? Um, I believe the number is around 960. So it's 80 per site. I think that's the right math, right? <laughs> um, so it is, I, I'm, well, we'll be honest here, it's a, it's a competitive program, right? Um, we're a national program, that's another reason. Um, and it's, you know, I saw some questions about travel and this, and we are a pretty much completely free program. Um, but one of the things you might, the only thing that I've noticed that students or applicants, um, or scholars uh, might be responsible for is um, uh, if you don't have health insurance, I know they usually provide a um, on-site option for that, but that's like one of the one requirements that is not always clear who covers what. Um, but other than that, like, uh, we pay, you know, the site pays for the travel assistance and I saw a question, sorry to go off the, the grid a little bit, but that's why it's a little bit competitive. <laughs> um, but I saw another question that I can just ask, answer real fast, um, for travel assistance, the sites do cover it. They'll work with you individually on that. Um, some sites have a cap, um, depending. So that's another reason why you want to check out that program site page. Um, but for the most part, it's when we say it's a free program, it's a free program. So thank you for that stuff. I appreciate that. And I noticed that there's students asking, you know, as far as help with crafting a personal statement and how to make that stand out. I just dropped a link tree um, to that has all of our social media accounts, but it also has all of our upcoming webinars. And one webinar that we will be hosting is how to make your SHPEP personal statement stand out. 
you know, so if you're looking for ways to, you know, write your personal statement or any quick tips and tricks, I highly recommend registering for this webinar. Our program site at the University of Nebraska Medical Center will be leading this session as well. So if you're interested in learning from a program site how to craft your personal statement, this would be the best time to do so. Um, this webinar in itself is going to be November 16th at 6 p.m. So, you know, definitely feel free to register, tell your friends about it, and tell your pre-health advisors as well. Definitely want to keep the community involved and informed. But see, speaking of personal statements, Austin, do you have any quick tips for us? Yeah, I would say be sure that you are reflective in your writing. That is so important. If you can show me or show an admissions committee member that you can really take the lessons learned from your experiences previously, that really tells us if we admit you and we start really teaching you a little bit about what the health professions is like, we're gonna be very confident in knowing that you're gonna absorb that information again. Um, talk about your experiences, talk about things that you're passionate about because those are the things that really come across really naturally instead of like a, a CV. People really don't wanna learn about your activities um, in that kind of format, I would say, in a personal statement. Talk about why something was meaningful to you. Those are really great ways to um, take advantage of that personal statement space. Thank you, Austin. And Stephanie, is it possible to move throughout the application if you don't know who will write your letter of recommendation? Yeah, um, you can put a placeholder, you know, I've even seen people put NA, you know, um, to kind of get past that part of the application. You could totally do that. Um, now, given that we, you can update for example, like the recommender portion, you could probably even submit it without it, but you know, just make sure you go and update it once you figure out your recommender. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the question, right? Just the recommendation part portion. Um, same thing with the, the personal statement. You could put a placeholder in there um, until you craft it and so you can move throughout it, you know, get all everything else completed that you want. Um, we even put, because we've had students before, put placeholders for their essay and forget to submit the essay. So what we did is we put a little check box at the certify and submit button um, that you actually have to check now. I mean, it's, it was implemented last season um, where you check that my personal statement is in there. And then we have a check for, you know, everything that you wrote at the time, you know, everything you're submitting is to your best knowledge, true and accurate. And then um, we have one final button that certifies and submit this. So once again, once you certify and submit, it's, it's done. Uh, the only thing you can update is your personal info and um, now your recommender if we haven't received it, right? So that's how that works. Thank you, Steph. And I'm putting my, myself in the role of a student right now. And I'm a first semester student. I'm interested in applying to SHPEP, but do I need to provide both my high school um, grades and my first semester grades? Only your post-secondary institution, which would be your current, you know, college that you're in. Um, and then of course, if you took any dual enrollment, but we do not, and I repeat, do not take high school transcripts. Please don't have them sent in. We don't need them. Uh, we only need post-secondary institution. So college level or uh, coursework sent in. Okay. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. So, you know, I'm, going to take this moment to give us to for each of us to give parting words so Austin if you'd like to help close us out give any type of feedback that you think would be helpful for applicants on this call to help them in their process so definitely that would be much appreciated if you could give some words yeah everyone who's uh, stayed with us this past hour thank you so much for coming tonight um, I really wish you the best in whatever your future endeavors are um, I'm excited for you guys to really start your applications. And I've dropped my information in the chat. You're always welcome to reach out to me. I'm always available to reach out and ask questions, bounce ideas off of. Um, any parting advice from me, take your time with your application. I, we just opened up less than a week ago or so. Um, it's still very early. 
we always emphasize, you know, you want to get your application in early, but at what cost if you're going to sacrifice quality, right? So take your time, think things through. Um, I just did one application recently and it's like, I did the demographics, who I am, where I live. And that was all I wanted to do that day because it was just enough for me. Do something like that. You don't need to take it all um, as one big sitting down event. Break it up into little pieces. Stephanie, would you like to give us some parting words? Sure. Um, thank you, Austin. That was uh, really great advice and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, take your time on the application. Uh, and like he said, you can break it up. And if you, like I, I mentioned earlier, a good goal to get your materials in January, mid-January, you could still take your time and submit your application a week later. It's fine, right? Um, so I would just say that uh, focus on getting, you know, your materials in that squared away, check your application status, please, 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 please just be on top of that. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we, we process things by hand still, unfortunately, so that, you know, mistakes can be made, but it's on you to make sure that everything gets completed. So please, uh, I would say my biggest parting advice is check that thing until everything's completed and ready to go. Thanks, Beth. You know, my parting words are don't be afraid to ask for help. I think sometimes as college students, particularly college freshmen and sophomore students, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And I, I think that's the best way to kind of put it and understanding what resources are available. It's it's pivotal. You, you, you know, what do they say? The like the more, you know, the more, you know, like, I don't know. But like at the end of the day, it, it's true. You know, you need to know. Uh, what resources are available in order to assist you. I'm glad I was able to drop that link tree. Uh, so like that, you could follow us on social media. Our ambassadors are very active as well. So, you know, you'll see a bunch of videos posted, you know, helping you on your path, not only uh, through SHPEP, but just even college tips as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. Follow us on YouTube. That's where all of our webinars are housed. So anytime we host an event, it's always posted on YouTube within a week of the live viewing. And, you know, reach out to your pre-health advisor. Your pre-health advisor is really going to help you structure things the way they need to be structured. You know, I'm, I'll be honest here and say, you know, when I write something, I always think I, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at writing, right? Like, I was like, wow, I, I knocked that one out the park. But sometimes, you know, we don't know we, it may come off different it may come off a certain type of way and it helps to have that that other set of eyes just to kind of add perspective because the last thing you want to do is say something or write something in such a way that it's not tasteful if that makes sense so that would be my go-to advice and i think that's it for the evening um I want to thank Austin and Stephanie for both joining us this evening, and I want to thank, you know, the audience, and I hope you're enjoying Health Professions Week. That being said, have a good evening, everyone. Same. Good night.